and just came in through the back. <coughs> Good morning. Welcome to Cali Chapel Inland Devo 30. I am Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, you're more than welcome to join us at 5383 Martin Street. Hmm? Right. Uh, and today we will be starting a new letter out of Philemon. So if you want to grab your Bibles, a highlighter, and a pen... And join us. We'd love to have you here. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get started. I have a lot of information for you about the little book itself. So I thought it would be pertinent since the book is kind of short. We'll be done with it this morning. So <laughs> let's pray. Gracious Father, I thank you, Lord, uh, for the opportunity to even open up your word and to be able to read it, yes, Father, Lord. to, a, to a, a few in the audience, Lord. Um, what a pr privilege that is, Lord, whether one or whether hundreds uh, listen to it, Father. I'm humbled by that, Father, call that you have given to me, Lord. I truly do not feel in any way or, or sense some entitlement to that calling, Lord, for I at times feel so unworthy, Lord, to be able to share your word, but you have called me to it, and I do the best that I can with what this brain <clears throat> allows me to, Lord, and... And, and in all humility, Lord, uh, just allow your Holy Spirit to minister, Father. And so we just pray, Lord, that whatever comes out, Father, would be of your spirit. Yes. And it would move in our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right. So we're in the book of Philemon. Um, <clears throat> I want to give you a little bit of background before we get started. Uh, Philemon, who is the uh, receiver of this letter from the Apostle Paul was a prominent leader within the uh, Kalashi church. And they met in their home, actually. Uh, and many believers were there dwelling with them and studying the Bible and the scriptures, actually receiving letters from the Apostle Paul, but studying the Old Testament scriptures. And the letter was really written for him. And so if you ever want to uh, read someone's letter, you know, someone says, oh, I received a letter, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, let me see it. Nope, you can't see it. Well, here's a little letter that was received from... Paul, the apostle to Philemon, and we're able to read it. <clears throat> now, the book claims that the apostle Paul is a writer, and we see that in verses 1, 9, and 19, a claim that few in the history of the church uh, dispute completely, so we know the apostle Paul is the author of this little letter. <clears throat> and especially since there's nothing in Philemon that uh, four goals uh, would have been <coughs> motivated to write. It is one of the prison epistles, along with Ephesians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, its close connection is with Colossians, uh, which Paul wrote at the same time, right around AD 60 to 62, from the time of the birth of Christ. Uh, brought earlier and unquestionable, uh, vindicated of Paul's authorship by the early church fathers, uh, Jerome, Christodom, and Theodore of uh, Moscosia. These were church fathers that actually read the letter and agreed that this was a letter from the Apostle Paul to, to Philemon. Now Philemon, <clears throat> just to give you a little bit of background, had been saved under Paul's ministry, uh, probably at Ephesus, and we see that in verse 19, several years earlier. Uh, wealthy enough to have a large house, verse 2, very clear. Philemon also owned at least one slave, a man named Onesimus. And Onesimus literally means uh, a common name for slave. Onimus, Onesimus was a believer at the time he stole some money from Philemon, verse 18. And Philemon then, uh, and he, from Philemon, then he ran away from Philemon. And this is where the Apostle Paul was uh, encountered with uh, Onesimus. And like, out, like countless thousands of other runaway slaves, Onesimus fled to Rome, seeking to lose himself in the capital crowds and so forth and then encountered the apostle Paul while he was in prison and then Paul was able to minister to him and send him back to to Onis, to um, Philemon who was his owner and then he became profitable to him and then we read later on that uh, Paul lists him in some of his other letters so obviously uh, Onesimus became useful in the ministry there so let's go ahead and, and get into the scriptures here <clears throat> Philemon verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. 
So apparently Timothy was with the Apostle Paul while he was there in prison uh, writing to uh, Philemon. And again, he referenced himself as a prisoner, not of Rome or of the emperor, but of Jesus Christ. Now that's an interesting observation to have of oneself, that you would not think of yourself as a criminal sitting in a jail cell because Rome has caught you. But you would think of yourselves as a minister of the gospel and a prisoner of Christ himself. That it was Christ that led him to this point. And knowing that by faith, because he didn't know what God would do through it all, Paul couldn't see the future, but he knew that God had a plan for him and that he would suffer great things. So he knew that he was in the hands of God and that it was God that truly was his captor in a sense, and he captured his heart, and Paul was more than willing to be a slave or a prisoner in someone's cell so that the gospel would go out. He goes on in verse 2, to the beloved Aphia, which means, Aphia, which means faithful. So here is probably the wife of Philemon, and she is a faithful wife, it says here, according to the definition of her name, uh, a wife that was to come alongside and help Philemon. Then Archippus, our fellow soldier. Uh, he calls him a soldier because he was a warrior in the Lord. He didn't back off. He was faithful to continue to serve God. And to the church in your house. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? To the church in your house. So the church always meets in a building, right? That's where the church meets. Uh, and by the way, he's not saying to the church in everyone's home that you're all staying and watching per video. No, he's saying, no, in the house where the believers are coming together and meeting with one another and the opening of the word of God. And I say that because, again, there are those that suggest that you don't have to go to church. And I don't know why they, they continue to cling to that because they know it's not true deep down inside. I think the Holy Spirit convicts them, but they just don't want to. Uh, give in to it. Uh, it's all over the place. Every epistle letter was written to the church that met in a building. And when you read <coughs> when you read Hebrews, it's very clear that it says that you're to meet in a building. You know, do not forsake the assembling of one another. And the word assembly is the word for synagogue. So it's a building. So don't forsake to gather in the synagogue and fellowship like some do. So it, it's clear that, that we as Christians should be going to church, whether it's in a house with a bunch of people and eventually it ends up in a building like in our case. <clears throat> Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers. Uh, Paul again referencing the fact that he was a prayer warrior. <clears throat> Hearing of your love and faith which you have towards the Lord Jesus and towards all the saints. Now, I like the order of this, and I'm sure in the Greek it's going to emphasize uh, the Lord Jesus first. When you read the Greek language, it's usually written backwards compared to the English language because of the emphasis. So if you probably were to read this, and I haven't uh, looked at it in the Greek, it would probably uh, mention the fact that um, he had love and faith towards the Lord first, and then towards the believers. Uh, I don't think that you can switch that. I don't think it works that way. I don't think you love believers and then you love the Lord. I think the reason you love believers is because you love the Lord. Amen. <clears throat> and so when the Lord has touched your heart, there are a lot of things that change in your life, uh, including your perspective, your personality, uh, your goals, your visions, uh, and your very being. And it all stems from being rooted in Christ Jesus. Uh, the Bible says that we love him because he first loved us. Uh, because his love came to us, we have learned to love him back. And when we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then we know that personal relationship uh, stems out as a root to his children. And you cannot have one without the other, by the way. You cannot just say, I love Christ, but I hate his people. Mm. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. Or I love his people, but I hate Christ. Mm. You know? Or I love people and humanity. You know, I'm a, human, human, uh, a humanitarian, but 
I'm not necessarily religious and I don't believe in Christ. Well, you can't have Christ and be a humanitarian. In other words, you can't have eternal life. They go together, just like the Father and Son and Holy Spirit all go together. You can't have one without the other. It just doesn't work. It's like planting a tree, but you're never going to water it and it's going to die. Or you water it all the time, but you've never planted it in the ground. You just laid it down, but you keep watering and wondering why it's going to die. You have to have it all working together and it works together. Here, so if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, then you will also love the brethren and you'll be praying for them always. He goes on in verse six, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The sharing here is the fellowship. It's the word koinonia. So that the fellowshipping of your faith may become effective. Now, notice it doesn't say the, the, the fellowshipping of yourself or of your emotions or of your feelings. It says of faith. It's a faith. When we fellowship, we fellowship by faith. If we were to look at one another, we probably wouldn't want to fellowship. <coughs> there's, there's too much uh, drama and too much garbage in everyone's life. And if we were to fellowship based on that, there wouldn't be a whole lot of fellowship. You know, there'd be a lot of separation. There are some people that do fellowship that way. They look at people and they go, ah, I don't like that person, and so I'm not going to fellowship with them. And they don't. They don't fellowship, and they set themselves little cliques. And so they become the little elite group over here and another little elite group over here because we're like-minded, because we're of this nationality, because of we're of this status, because we're of this type of ministry. And it happens, and it still happens today, sadly to say. You know, even our church doesn't draw the wealthiest of people because we're in a community that's not wealthy. We're in a community that's prominently Hispanic, <clears throat> though we do have other nationalities. And so there's a tendency of people who do come here, though they because they know it's a Calvary Chapel, and they know that uh, they're going to go through the Bible. And when they get here, yet they see uh, the types of social people that are here, and sometimes it's not something that's palatable to their taste or liking. And so they don't stay very long, and they want to find some place where they fit in. And I hear that all the time. Where, where do I fit in? Where can I go that that meets my needs? I have, I have A through B and I want to see them met. And I understand that, setting goals and having guidelines. Um, I think though that sometimes we overdo it. Uh, we, should, we should also understand that we are to walk by faith. And that's what he's saying here. We're having fellowship uh, of your faith. It's the commonality of Jesus Christ. Uh, iron sharpens iron. Uh, you can't sharpen iron without another piece of iron. Amen. And in this case, uh, the psalmist is saying, or the Proverbs is saying, that, that a brother will sharpen another brother. It's not the outside world, that's persecution and so forth. It's within the church that we sharpen one another. And that only happens in fellowship. Uh, but some of us don't like when a sword hits another sword and it makes the sound and it's deafening to the ears or it shoots off that spark and you got to close your eyes. We don't like that. And so we run away from that. And so here he's saying this fellowship, this koinonia is by faith. <clears throat> and it may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. Now he didn't just say in you, but in Christ Jesus, because there's <coughs> nothing good in me, right? Isaiah said it very clearly that our righteousness are like filthy rags. You know, our hearts are deceitful, evil, wicked. Who can even know them? Genesis 6 the imagination, uh, while it was forming, was evil. Very clearly, Corinthians says the same thing, that um, it, it is our imagination that is corrupt. And so, um, what good is in us? Well, it's Christ. When we remove ourselves and let Christ live in us and through us, that's what is good. When we deny ourselves, which isn't easy, it's very difficult to do. So, it's always in Christ Jesus. That's where the power comes. For we have great joy and consolation now, the word, word consolation just means comfort. We have comfort or refreshing, in a sense. In your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brethren. <clears throat> it's always comforting and joyful when everyone's getting along, right? <laughs> when there's no drama and there's no... Um, divisions and skirmishes and things like that. It's a joyful and, and 
comforting thing to see the body of Christ working together. Uh, I always love to see events come about because it takes a lot of work to get events to go. And, and once they're going, though, and you see the, the results of it, the fruit as people are working together, running around, and, yeah, it gets hectic and you're trying to figure things out. It might even get a little dis stressful, but you see the people coming in and enjoying it, yeah. and you go, wow, this is so cool. Yeah. It's so refreshing. It's so comforting to see how it just came together and God just, just blessed it. So it's a refreshing to the brethren. Therefore, verse 8, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul basically said, I have the authority you know, to, to encourage you or even command you to do what is right. And he did. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ, and so he had that authority. That's why he's writing this letter to them because he has some authority. Of course, uh, the only authority he has is what they allow him to because if Philemon could have just taken the letter, ripped it up, and threw it away. But he understood how God's government works, that God calls men. And as he's calling men, he fills them and directs them and leads them, and we as his children are to acknowledge the men that God calls. We see that with Moses. In fact, we're going to see it tonight in Numbers chapter 16. So much there that I, I saw this time compared to the last time I taught it. I didn't realize um, how merciful God was to Korah. We always hear about Korah coming up against Moses and God mm -hmm. swallowing him up. But God was still merciful to Korah. It's, it's amazing that he spared a part of Korah's family and they went on to do some some blessings uh, to the the body of Christ or the body of yeah body of Christ. So we'll see that tonight, and it just goes to show you that it's not all about the the judgment of God, but there is judgment of God and correction of God, but the mercy and the grace of God that He has towards even those that uh, stand up against His anointed, because that's what they did. They stood up against Moses as God's anointed, and it wasn't about Moses. It was about the position that Moses held and the fact that God called him to it. Um, I theme tonight's message, um, God's call, God's leader. Mm. You know? And that's basically what, what God has done with Moses, with the Apostle Paul, with Peter and all the other 12, and with every pastor of every church. And I think that the church today has diminished that because the culture has diminished it. You know, there used to be a time when pastors were actually esteemed where presidents would want pastors to be, you know, at their sides when they're, um, you know, giving a message or, or, or some event or conference. And Billy Graham would be at almost all of them. You'd see him there, and even opening up in prayers. And you don't see that as much anymore because the culture has diminished the authority of the church. They're trying to remove the church. And so they're not giving them that authority anymore. And because of that, now the church has, has grasped that, even though, they know that that's not true. It's still they've grasped that and they don't put the importance that's there, uh, that God has lifted those, those men up. Um, and, and we're seeing that more and more today. Even prayer within our communities at um, our board meetings for you know, the, the, the governments of it all, uh, even prayer is no longer um, narrow-minded in the sense where they used to have Christian prayer, you know, pastors praying, but now it is open. So you can, you can be a spiritualist and they, want, they, would, they would ask you to come in and just pray because of the whole tolerance thing and, and not wanting to make a stand for what truly is true. So we just see that. So Paul had, had the authority to do it, but you know, he didn't want to use that authority. He'd rather do it by appealing of love, you know, by the fact that I loved you. You know, I was instrumental in your salvation. Um, I helped you grow in your faith. I poured into you. I, I taught you uh, biblical truths. Um, these are things that all pastors do, and then, and then someone just turns their back on you, just like that, and forgets all that you've done for them. <clears throat> That's probably one of the most hurtful things for leaders. You know, I'm sure uh, per Moses... Because Korah's going to blame him and Dathan and, and Anum. You know, they went up to the promised land. And Moses messed up. He should have just went in. He should never have sent in spies. He should have just, God said go in. He should have just went in. But he listened to the people and said, let's send some spies in. And they came back fearful. And so they came back fearful. And, and the whole 
Israel, you know, turned around back into the wilderness because they were so fearful and God judged them for that. But then later on, uh, Dathan and Korah likes that. That's your fault, Moses, that we're wondering now. They put the blame back on him uh, because they were fearful. And it's like, God, don't you, you just don't win. You just don't win. <coughs> no matter what, you know, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. And so he has to deal with that. And yet Moses still had mercy and compassion because there was a point where, and this is tonight's message, I'm kind of giving it away, but he, God deals with Korah and then swallows them up. And then the 200 and something people uh, that were by his side, he then consumes them with fire. But then the rest of the people who did nothing, these are the people that like, uh, like somebody comes in and they divide the church. And, well, I'll give you an example. There was a, a young man that came into one of the board meetings and accused me of some stuff. And so I... I defended, I defended the truth by, by saying what you're doing is, is not right and you misunderstand how this works. And so when we all realized that, you know, he was like, oh, okay, <laughs> boy, was I wrong. And then after that was all over and I handled and so forth, uh, he left and the board goes, you were kind of harsh with him. And I'm like, what? He just tried to divide the church and now you're, I'm harsh with him? You know, and those are the people that that watch what people do, but they're like, but we still need to love them and and just touch them, and be, you know. And it's like, what? I mean, Paul in Titus, we just read it too, right? If a person is divisive, they have nothing to do with them. Don't fellowship with them anymore. But God judges them, and then all of a sudden, plagues came upon them, and He started judging them. And Moses is now running around going, Lord, what do you, okay, Aaron, go get some sacrifices, go offer them because God's going to wipe them all out. And, and so they offered the sacrifice and God, you know, was atoned because of the sacrifice. So you see the compassion of Moses too at the same time. Um, you probably would not have seen that in Moses if not that part of his life was put in, this, in the scriptures because it says he got in his face and he got angry and he told the Lord, don't accept their sacrifice, blah, 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 blah. And you would have thought, wow, Moses is mean. You know, if you, you mess with him, he'll, he'll get you back. You know, and just go straight to God and he'll chastise you. But then all of a sudden he tells Aaron, go get the sacrifices because he's going to wipe out all these people. He had compassion for the people that were embracing him and saying, oh, it's okay. We still want to love them. You know, and of course you can love someone that's cancerous, but they're going to just continue to bring cancer in your, into your church. So... He had the authority, but he wanted to do it love's sake. Um, just let it be through love that we do things. I appeal to you, verse 10, for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you. Therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, on that yourself behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. So again, you, you can see the compassion in Paul's heart here for Onesimus and for Philemon, right? I, I want you guys to work this out equitably, you know? Um, <clears throat> somehow come together and forgive one another and work to making things right. Um, and that should be the heart of every person is to make things right and work together. Um, I had a situation where I had to take care of something and 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 those in authority of, of of Calvary agreed and said, well, then you you can get with them and you can work it out. I'm like, yeah, definitely. I'm more than willing to do that because that's what we should all do is work to a place where there's true repentance, true sorrows like Corinthians says, and then the restoration comes. And that's what Paul is saying here. Onesimus is truly repentance. Now, what does that mean? Because people are like, well, if I just say I'm sorry, no, that doesn't cut it. That doesn't cut it. True repentance is saying I am sorry and what do I need to do to restore what I've done, right? And if I've stolen from you, then I need to repay what I've taken from you. That's true repentance. In fact, when you see salvation, it always begins with <coughs> repent. Always begins. And what is you repenting of? Your life. Your past sins, I will no longer, you know, be held to that old way. I'm now going to live a new way for Christ. And so there's got to be repentance for restoration. But without your consent, verse 14, I wanted to do nothing that your good deeds might not be 
by compulsion, as it were, but voluntarily. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, <clears throat> no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. I, I love the fact that Paul guessed, because we're always guessing with things. Maybe God's doing this, you know? Something goes wrong and we're like, ah, maybe God's trying to teach us a lesson. What is he trying to teach? I don't know. And, and Paul's like, maybe he left you for a reason. Maybe it's because now you can receive him back forever. You know, maybe the relationship wasn't a great one in the beginning because he was your slave and maybe you were a little harsh with him. Maybe he was a little lazy with you, you know, and those things don't always work right when both parties are at fault. <clears throat> and maybe now God is going to turn this around for good and you're going to receive him. And I love that, that he didn't say, this is exactly what. He was kind of like, maybe this, I can see that God is doing something like this. And when we go through things, we can kind of see that, that God is doing something like this, right? Um, we, we might be going through financial struggles and we're like, well, Lord, what are you doing? Oh, and just look at your, look at your life and go, why am I going through financial struggles? Am I, am I overspending? Maybe God's trying to teach you, you don't need those things. Maybe you need to stop spending so much. You don't need the Starbucks every single morning, right? You don't need to go to the movies. You don't need to go eat out twice or three times a week. I mean, there used to be a time when we never ate out. People never really ate out. Restaurants weren't the big deal. It was staying home and cooking a meal. And the talk, of the, uh, the talk at work was how good my wife cooked. You know, not how good Johnny Carino's was. You know, it was how good my wife can cook, you know. And then, and then you'd bring some for the potluck that you'd have at work. And everybody like, wow, that was great, you know. Uh, where I grew up in Southern California, Edison, there would be uh, families that knew how to cook. And they'd actually make burritos for all the guys in the morning. And you'd pay them a couple of bucks and they'd have burritos. You know, but that used to be the thing. But maybe we should not be going out. You know, you wonder why you're not paying tithes. Why you're struggling, that could be another thing. Maybe God's trying to teach you that you gotta give him his 10% because you're robbing him, Malachi says. And so you're not, gonna, you're not gonna reap what you're sowing. And if you're not sowing anything, boy, you're not gonna reap anything. I mean, come on, it's almost, it's, it's almost hilarious because you get that principle in your head and now people don't wanna hear it. I know that because they don't wanna give and they don't wanna have faith. <clears throat> but it's almost hilarious. You, can you imagine a farmer, I'm buying a farm. Big house, tractors, the whole thing, seeds, all of it. Yeah, all right, we're gonna grow corn. Gets up in the morning, honey, let's get up, let's, let's, just, let's, let's just start reaping the harvest. What do we do? Well, we just wait. What do we do with the seed? I don't know, just leave it there. Well, shouldn't we plant it? Nah, let's not plant it. God, God's good, God's good. If you never plant the seed, are you gonna reap anything? No. no. It's like a farmer saying there, okay, we tilled the land, <clears throat> we did everything. Where's the crop? Why isn't it coming up? We're watering it. We're, going, we're, we're taking care of it. We're here on the land. We're here at the church. We're here at the property. We're here fellowshipping. We're having parties and everything. Where's the crop? Where's the crop? You haven't planted any seeds. You haven't planted the seeds in there. You haven't taken the time to put everything in there and, and, and then water it and so forth. And if you don't plant the seeds, you're not going to reap anything. And the same truth is for our financial situation. If you're not planting seeds in the kingdom of God, you're not going to reap anything in the kingdom. Maybe that's what it is. So Paul is kind of guessing. But I think that when you look at what's going on, you can say, wow, God is doing that, isn't he? I mean, them two were struggling. Obviously, he ran away. <clears throat> but now he's back, and now their relationship will be solid. And I've seen that happen. I remember Chuck Missler had a young man... <clears throat> who was in his ministry and was vital, and they had a, a, a breakup and went away. And then it was like 10, 15 years later, a young man came back and in total repentance and was, again, vital with Chuck Missler's ministry and helped him just take it further than what it had ever been because of that. And those things happen all the time, forever. Verse 16, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dear, beloved brother especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would receive me. 
But if he has wronged you or owes you nothing or anything, put it on my account. Now there's a repentance, right? Because Paul's saying there has to be repentance. So if he owes you, he obviously can't pay you back, but I'll pay it for him. That's the repentance. That's the cost of the restoration. He's going to give you everything that you lost and I'll be the one that, that does it for him. And obviously that's speaking of Jesus Christ. So he has done that for all of us. I am, or he's, verse 19, I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest uh, room for me, for I trust that though your, through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Ephroditus, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, uh, Archicus, Demas, uh, Luke, my fellow laborer, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. 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 You know, in that repentance, um, <clears throat> on the other hand, uh, Philemon could have said, don't worry about it, Paul. You know, I, I know how much you've done for me. You shared the gospel with me, and I got saved, and my household is so grateful for that, so I don't want anything from him. And that's how it works, right? When it's offered, and then the one that's receiving it says, you know what, it's cool, I'm glad you offered it, because that's true repentance, but now I'm saying keep it, and let's just restore a relationship. And that's how it works. That's how it should work. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for, wow, this little letter we could have gone on for for weeks, Lord, so much in there, Lord. May you just minister to us with what the Spirit has given today, Lord. And we pray for your blessings upon your people, Lord. And, and Lord, if there's <clears throat> there's any sin in any of us, Lord, any rebelliousness, Lord God, any division, Lord, that we would do whatever it takes, Lord, to restore those relationships, Father. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. <clears throat> If you have any prayer requests, please post them and we will pray for you.